trickling in. So I think uh, now it's a couple minutes after 5.30, we'll get started here. And um, I appreciate you all coming and sitting in with us this evening as we discuss uh, Leonard Baskin's Native American portraits that are currently on view in the center part of our gallery in the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christine Rank Carter. I'm the curator for the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. And uh, our esteemed director, Teresa, is letting me take the reins this evening. And she is sitting in the galleries while I'm sitting down in the archives because I wanted to uh, make sure that you saw a couple of prints that we have in the collection that we couldn't put in the gallery. Um, as you're logging in, please remember to uh, try to keep yourself on mute. We will be using the chat feature uh, for you to answer to enter questions, which we'll uh, try to get to towards the end of the talk. Um, I, I warn you, I, I dived pretty deep into this um, and I hope that it doesn't take too long, but um, I hope you will bear with me because I've just uncovered some really interesting things while looking into Baskin's portrait and um, some of the history of it, which is pretty, pretty great. Um, but anyway, so we'll get started. And just a reminder, this is recorded. So what I'm gonna do is just share my screen here. And certainly if you have any issues or questions, um, Teresa will actually be monitoring the chat throughout this talk. Feel free to uh, jump in and, and you can ask her a question or if you need any assistance. Okay. All right. So we are discussing Leonard Baskin Native American portraits. Um, the museum has a pretty nice collection of Leonard Baskin's work that covers a range of his topics. Um, but this particular exhibition we're really excited about because it complements uh, Jared Raglan and Carrie Norton, Where You Come From is Gone. Um, these exhibitions will be on view through May 16th. So you have plenty of time to come see them in person. So a little bit about Leonard Baskin. Trying to just advance my, now it's not working, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try that again. Okay, sorry about that. A little bit about Leonard Baskin. He was a renowned American sculptor, illustrator, printmaker, writer, and educator. Throughout his career, he was committed to figurative art and the theme of human mortality. Born in New Brunswick, New Jersey in 1922, Baskin was the son of a rabbi and raised in the Jewish Orthodox neighborhood of Williamsburg in Brooklyn, New York. In 1936, Baskin was about 14 years old when he saw a clay modeling demonstration on the fifth floor of the Macy's department store. He was transfixed and vowed to become a sculptor at that moment. He bought five pounds of clay and brought it home with him to make sculptures that day of Venus and Moses. Believe it or not, he had his first exhibition as an artist at age 17 at the Glickman Studio Gallery in New York City. It's quite likely that Baskin saw the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in 1936, which you see here uh, portrays the cartoonish um, floats, or I'm sorry, cartoonish balloons of the American Indian. While Baskin was studying at Yale University on scholarship, he loved the library and discovered the works of artist and poet William Blake, which inspired him to also become an artist and a poet and a printmaker. He found endless inspiration in the darkness and mysticism of William Blake's work and shared his great respect for words combined with imagery, which led Baskin to teach himself printmaking. While at Yale, Baskin founded Gehana Press in 1942, one of the first fine art presses in the United States. 
He operated the press for over 50 years until his death in the year 2000, making it one of the longest running and most successful private presses of all time. He produced over 400 woodcuts, lithographs, and engravings, and published more than 100 handmade illustrated books. After serving in the Navy in World War II, Baskin earned a Bachelor of Arts degree at the New School for Social Research in 1949. From the 1950s to the 1970s, he taught printmaking and sculpture at Smith College, where he had become good friends with writer Ted Hughes and his wife, Syl Sylvia Plath. In 1974, Baskin decided to move to Devon, England, where he would collaborate with Ted Hughes on several published works over the course of 10 years. Baskin returned to the States in 1984, where he taught at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, and created major sculptural works for the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, DC, and the Holocaust Memorial in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Although he was best known for his printmaking, Baskin always considered himself first and foremost as a sculptor. According to his brother, Bernard, his prints represented his ongoing sculptural thinking and involvement. Baskin moved seamlessly between the two mediums, which really go hand in hand as one medium informs the other. Many printmaking processes are based on sculptural techniques like carving, relief, manipulating a plate like you would the surface of a sculpture. The Lieber Ratner Museum of Art is actually very lucky to have one of Baskin's etching plates, which I'm going to show you right here which looks really large in this computer screen. But this is a portrait of composer Gustav Mahler. And this etching plate, it's a steel etching plate that you can, if you can kind of see, it's just got kind of a sculptural surface from being dipped in acid over and over again, which you can see why a sculptor would be attracted to printmaking. This exhibition of Native American portraits is part of a large collection of works by Baskin given to the museum by print collector Lothar Yule. With over 200 prints, illustrated books, and ephemera, Lerma is believed to have one of the largest holdings of prints by Baskin in any museum collection. And Lothar actually passed away in 2016, but we were blessed to, to have many exhibitions with him and of his work. And you might recall that this particular little gallery that um, links our permanent collection galleries with our changing exhibition galleries is dedicated to Mildred and Lothar. And we have constant rotating exhibitions of works on paper in his honor. A committed figurative artist with respect for tradition, Baskin's prolific body of work features a diverse cast of characters often focused on themes of mortality and the macabre, Judaism, the Holocaust, Greek mythology, predatory birds and animals with human-like qualities, and Native Americans. All are connected by his social consciousness and his high regard for humanity. For decades, Baskin was at odds with the modern art movements that dominated the art scene. He abhorred abstract expressionism. Don't tell Alan Lipa. Just when the other artists in the 1950s and 1960s abandoned the human figure in their art, Baskin placed it in front and center. Baskin wrote uh, a quote when, from an interview from Time Magazine, our human frame our gutted mansion, our enveloping sack of beef and ash is yet a glory, glorious in defining our universal sodality and in defining our utter uniqueness. The human figure is the image of all men and of one man. It contains all and expresses all. Man is capable of infinite variation. Perhaps the best example of this is Man of Peace from 1952, which you see on the right here. This breakthrough five foot woodcut recalls recent memories of the Holocaust, the Korean War and the threat of nuclear weapons that were just on the rise in the 50s. He thought of this print as an ambulatory mural, instantly black 
or sorry, insistently black, complexly cut and reasonably successful at causing alarm, misgivings and exaltation. Widely recognized for his expressive yet representational approach to the figure, Baskin produced many illustrations and sculptures for public and government commissions from the 1960s to the 1990s. A couple of examples include this US postage stamp of Henry David Thoreau from 1967 and a bronze monument of the 30 foot uh, bas relief of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial of his funeral cortege that he did in 1975. For these commissions, Baskin did research to fully understand and accurately portray historical figures and, and events. While other artists were, would recreate a romanticized vision of the past, Baskin was a master at humanizing a historical figure, stripping down and excavating the soul of that person in a mere few expressive lines. This is best represented in two important lithographic portrait series commissioned by the US federal government, the Custer Battlefield Handbook in 1968 and the Leaders of the Constitution 1787, which was a handbook that um, we actually displayed the prints of this past fall. For the framing of the federal constitution handbook, Baskin looked to the neoclassical portrait painters of the 18th century, such as Gilbert Stuart. Stuart's iconic portrait of George Washington served as Baskin's inspiration, which you can see on the left. The sensitivity with which Baskin captures the essential fac facial features bringing our founding fathers to present day with a direct yet unpretentious presence. In 1968, Baskin was commissioned by the National Park Service to illustrate a handbook about Custer Battlefield, now known as Little Bighorn Battlefield Monument. This project led Baskin to a, proun, a profound and ongoing interest in Native Americans, which resulted in a large series of iconic portraits over the course of 30 years. Custer Battlefield memorialized the infamous 1876 battle between the US Army's 7th Cavalry and the Lakota Cheyenne people. Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custard and 263 soldiers died fighting several thousand Indian warriors who were trying to preserve the, their way of life. Baskin admits this project roused him from an acute attendance from ignorant indifference about the Native Americans. As he immersed himself in the details of his research, he was appalled at the injustice directed toward the American Indians. Baskin concluded that Custer was a shame and not worthy of this adulation. He came to an almost instant hatred of Custer and a deep admiration for the Indians who destroyed him. But he still had to do the portrait of Custer for this project. And you can see in this portrait, the glint in Custer's eye as Baskin brings forward the general's true nature. Now this particular piece, which was used for the cover of the handbook, uh, we did not include in our exhibition because we wanted to make sure that it was about the Native American faces. Uh, what I've done, if you can see behind me, uh, the print is actually pulled from our vault and I've displayed it along next to um, Baskin's self-portrait. So you can get a sense of, of the scale of the piece but also sort of the, the glowering look of Custer looking over my shoulder as I talk about the Native Americans. Baskin was deeply moved by the plight of the Sioux people and the injustice and the insensitivity of the destruction of their culture and race. This resonated with his own awareness of the Holocaust and his Jewish heritage. The Sioux were recognized as masters of the North American plains and prairies, and they were feared by other tribes. Today, they cover 2,782 square miles in South Dakota and the neighboring states with peoples primarily living on reservations. Baskin wrote about these portraits, quote, it would be fitful and absurd for me to recount the slaughter with disease, booze, and guns, but allow me in raging haplessness to indict our government, not merely for the broken treaties, but for allowing Indians to be shut up in reserves, 
live in blight and misery and left to the deadly mercy of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. As a result of the Custer Project, Baskin gained an understanding for and appreciation of the plight of all Native Americans. He tried to show their cautiousness to trust and their sense of isolation through his work. He created 50 large lithographs, including two suites, the first in 1972 and the second in 1993, in which he portrayed their heroes and community. Each captures the sense of loss and betrayal that they experienced while also depicting their courage, resolve, and dignity. To better understand the rich and complex history of the American Indians and the West, Baskin drew inspiration from the past as well as the present to create a series of raw and expressive, expressive portraits for the Custer Project. The Western novel, Little Big Man, done in 1964 by Thomas Berger, served as a historical roadmap to understanding these larger than life figures of the Old West. Baskin also recognized the harsh realities Native Americans face in contemporary society. He was inspired by the activism and highly publicized protests happening at the time from the newly established American Indian movement. AIM was a militant civil rights organization that formed in 1968, right as Baskin was working on this project. AIM protested the centennial commemoration of the Custer Battlefield site in 1976, and the site which the site revered Custer and the Battle of Little Bighorn as part of a heroic saga of American history and expansion into the West and argued that it celebrated an act of genocide. The government eventually renamed the site Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument in 1991 to include the Native American tribes involved. Noted in the Custer Battlefield Handbook from 1968, more than 900 pictures of the Custer fight were cataloged by the Amon Carter Museum staff. Custer's last stand was the most memorialized single event in American history. Baskin cuts through a century of mediocre, apocryphal pictures to reveal the actors of this tragic drama as they were, not in the event, but in life and in death. Most artist depictions were absorbed in the reality of the event and neglected the human overtones. We see man's mortality, brutality, and futility. And yet we read in the faces of Baskin's people, the basic humanity which ties us together in a tragic climax no one seems to comprehend. Baskin puts a face to this battle. Chief Magpie Eagle Feathers of the Cheyenne was born to big man and magpie woman of Stonecap's band around 1851. In, in 1876, he participated in the Battle of the Rosebud and was wounded twice. A week later, he participated in the Battle of Little Bighorn against Custer. By the 1890s, he was elected to the Cheyenne Chiefs Council and converted to Christianity as the first adult Indian in the Cheyenne Church of Contentment. As part of the reburial ceremony in 1930, Chief Magpie said, quote, I have forgiven General Custer for the part he has played in the Battle of the Washita, and I pray that God will forgive Custer. Magpie died in his sleep eventually in 1931. For these projects, Baskin looked to the 19th century phot photographers Edward Curtis and Frank A. Reinhardt for inspiration. Many of the portraits in this series are based on Reinhardt's photographs taken in 1898 at the Indian Congress and the Omaha Trans-Mississippi International Exhibition. Held in Omaha, Nebraska, this World's Fair showcased the development of the entire West and included the Indian Congress, which was the largest gathering of American Indian tribes to, date, to that date. Over 500 members of 35 different tribes attended to show living displays of their customs, battle reenactments, and dances, which all took place in an arena. Reinhardt and his assistant, Adolf Muir, made several hundred photographs of the tribes during the expo. Their work is regarded as one of the most complete, non-exotifying collections of Native American portraits in existence. And here's one of those portraits. 
From those photographs, the dignified and stoic nature of these Native American chiefs resonates through Baskin's portraits. His direct and decisive mark making reveals their underlying despair and the profound sense of loss and betrayal they experienced, evident in their eyes and the etched lines to their faces. Geronimo, known as the one who yawns, was born to the Beden Cohe band of the Apache in modern day New Mexico. Geronimo was a fierce Apache warrior known for his skill in raids and ability to command large numbers of men in war warfare. As a prisoner of war under guard, armed guard at Fort Sill, he attended the 1898 Indian Congress and was considered one of their celebrity guests. During the Indian Congress parade, Geronimo broke ranks from his guards and his Apache contingency to give a welcoming hug to his American rival, General Nelson Miles, who was presiding over the parade in the review stand. Some of these portraits rely on Baskin's bold and graphic use of line, as seen in this example, a Cheyenne woman in the robes of a secret society. Baskin captured the essence of Chief Wetsit of the Assiniboine in very few details. Chief Wetsit was a prominent war leader and is most well known for leading a delegation of Assiniboine to the Indian Congress and Exposition. You will note that Baskin's portraits are facing the opposite direction of Reinhardt's photographs. In lithography, when the artist draws the image on stone, the image is printed in reverse. Note that this is particularly difficult when adding text to an image as the artist must write the text in reverse, which you can kind of see as we look at his portraits that he's written the names of the different chiefs on the prints or on the plates when they're printed. Sleeping Bear was a member of the, the Sikongu Lakota. This portrait was taken by Reinhardt on October 7th, 1898 at the exposition. But Baskin also introduced vibrant color, likely inspired by the visually stimulating headdresses and raiment of the ceremonial robes of the Native American chiefs. Chief American Horse was an Oglala Lakota chief, statesman, educator, and historian. He served in, as a US Army Indian scout and was a progressive leader who promoted friendly associations with white settlers and education for his people. Inci incidentally, this particular print is part of a portfolio of Native American portraits Baskin created from stone lithographs published by Kennedy Galleries, which also published many of Abraham Ratner's portfolios. Chief American Horse was also one of the first Wild Westers with Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and supported the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Today, Chief American Horse is not really viewed favorably among the Native Americans. Chief Kill Spotted Horse was the Assiniboine of the Assiniboine tribe, also known as the Nakoda. This nomadic tribe of Native Americans roamed the Northern Great Plains and were members of the Iron Confederacy with the Cree. Push Aside was the principal leader and war chief of the Kotsiteka band of the Comanche in the 1860s and 70s during the Texas Indian Wars. Now we've come to Chief Goat Joseph uh, who was popularly known also as Young Joseph or Joseph de Younger. And he was the leader of the Nez Pierce of the interior Pacific Northwest in the latter half of the, eight, of the 19th century. Chief Joseph led his band of the Nez Pierce when they were forcibly removed to the United, by the United States government from their ancestral lands in the Wallowa Valley in Northeastern Oregon onto a small reservation in Idaho. They resisted removal and attempted to flee the United States, seeking asylum alongside the Lakota under Sitting Bull in Canada. Although their retreat was un unsuccessful, the skill with which Chief Joseph and his band fought and the manner in which they conducted themselves earned widespread ad admiration from their military opponents and the American people. For his passionate principled resistance to his tribe's forced removal, Chief Joseph became renowned as a humanitarian and a peacemaker. 
Leonard Baskin has received many honors throughout his career, including six honorary doctorate degrees and gold medals from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, among many other awards. His sculptures, watercolors, and prints are collected worldwide by renowned museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Vatican Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Tate Gallery in London. I think Baskin would agree that perhaps one of his greatest accomplishments is that his series of Native American portraits are respected and admired by the people he represents in his work. These timeless portraits merge the past with the present and serve as a powerful reminder of the dignity, strength, and perseverance of human nature. So with that, that ends the presentation and we are happy to open it up to questions. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to sort of pitch your way, Christine. Um, okay. Just a reminder, uh, you guys can use the chat to send any questions in that you might have on this. Um, first off, we have a comment um, leading off that is quite interesting about the fact that um, Cohen, uh, uh, that, um, you know, Gehenna Press was the name of um, Baskin's uh, press. And uh, the point was that Gehenna is a Jewish word signifying hell. Um, in your research on, and this sort of ties in with another question, in your research on um, Baskin, did you find anything that sort of indicated why he was interested in these sort of darker elements? Um I think, well, certainly, um, I think William Blake opened him up to that. Maybe he was always attracted to the dar darker side of things in the macabre. Um, I think perhaps part of it was his experience growing up in the Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish community um, and the religious texts and things like that, which tend to go hand in hand. And William Blake very much um, uh, illustrated that as well. And I think, falling under the spell of William Blake. Um, he followed that path of the macabre. Um, I mean, there's some lighthearted things too, but but really Baskin's work is is always kind of geared towards the darker side of, of life and humanity. Does that answer the question? But yes, it, it does come up. Um, I didn't really um, go into detail about the, uh, the, the origin of Gahana Press's name because it, it was getting a little dark <laughs> trying to keep it upbeat um we've got another question uh that maybe you can touch on for us um you mentioned in two different parts um in, in one instance that baskin was working um with stone lithographs and in a second part about his etchings um did he seem to favor one over the other or were there other um, types or other processes that he was exploring that you've come across? I mean, he was a, a certainly a Renaissance man and a man of all trades. Um, I don't know the exact number of his total output, even though they say over 400. Um, he's pretty consistent across the board of evenly representing all printmaking methods. And the fact that he also um, incorporated that into the published works that he did uh, as far as handbound books and portfolios and incorporating text. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty even across the board from his representation of the different methods from what I've seen. And that doesn't even get into like the whole series of, um, of Native American portrait watercolors that he did. I mean, he certainly, um, uh, and, and sculpture is a whole other level, um, even though it's kind of interesting that he tends to always go back to sculpture and you see that sculptural quality no matter what he does in his work. Um, we have a great question that's sort of a follow up to talking about Gehenna Press. Um, are there other artists um, uh, that we might know of that printed at his press? Um, that's a good question. They talk more about um, the authors that he worked with, like Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath and um, renowned poets. 
Um, apparently he also did commercial printing and published a lot of books through commercial printing. Um, I'm, I, I actually do not know the answer to that as far as who else he would have um, printed at his studio, um, unlike Atelier 17 with um, Stanley William Hader, who worked quite a bit with other artists and was very open um, with his studio. I'm not sure how open Baskin was with Gahana Press, even though um, there was a time where he uh, went away uh, for World War II, fought in World War II, and he had to shut down his press for a little while. And he would studied in, in Europe soon after that, and then came back and got his bachelor's degree. And that whole time his press was in place, but I, I don't think it was being used. And I, so I think he was very, very independent. I think I saw a, uh, I think I saw a hand go up uh, from Gail. Um, Gail, are you there? Did you have a question for us? Hi, no, I, I did not have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please don't apologize. We're all, we're all using new technologies still, so no apologies. Um, I I see Sheila and Howard look like they have a question. Sheila's raising her hand. <laughs> oh, she's on mute. Sheila, you gotta, you're on mute. Can I unmute her? No, she's gotta unmute herself. Uh, unmute. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Next next week is Passover, and this is a famous Agata that he illustrated, which has always been my favorite because as a child we never understood the Hebrew, and my grandfather and my uncles and my parents would go on forever in Hebrew and we would look at pictures and we used to have of course the Maxwell House Haggadah but when we yeah. became if you love coffee it was good <laughs> when, we, when we got married we would we invested in the Baskin Haggadah and we used it for many seders and this and is, can you see uh, the picture I don't That's know. amazing. This you see the is, picture? This is one of the pictures. This is the question of the four sons. Oh, which wow. Ask about the four children, and each one is different, and how you reply to each. And then there's another, there are several illustrations, but then there's I have not, this is also a portrait. Can you see it over there? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic book. You're so lucky to have that. I have a whole collection. I had 18 of these. Oh my gosh. Paperback, and the paperbacks were not, they never stood up well. The pages fell out. So oh. I am uh, down to six of those, I think. But we bought these for the leadership and for the person leading the theater in large print. Then here's another one. Oh, Sheila's back on mute. That's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, That's you're quite lovely. And then there's one of the, there were more, there was one of the, this is at the, the 10 plagues. You have lice, frogs. Oh, that, wow. That's the first born. And there are, you know, all of these fabulous illustrations. And when people discuss what Haggadah are you going to read from? We always say the Baskin. <laughs> I, I never realized that. That's a famous artist. 
I have one book that's worth something. Yeah, it's a very precious book. I it know is. Very lucky. And we still love it. I, we've now shot, because of Zoom, we've now shortened the whole thing to like two or three pages. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you've got good use out of that book too. That's that's um, that's amazing. We do. It it would be great for um, uh, to for us to pull out all of the the work that we have by Baskin. is It's really quite amazing. And some of the artist books, including uh, some of his very first published books, um, but it's it's an amazing array of of. Um, of not only mediums, but but imagery and, and stories and portfolios. And we're just, we're so lucky for um, Lothar Yule's friendship and the friendship of other collectors so that we can celebrate these artists. Do we have some other, other questions? We do, we have a couple other questions in the chat. Um, one is a, a question sort of related to uh, the month that we're in and a program that we took part in last night with the incredible Palm Harbor Museum. Um, you showed that there was one work um, in this uh, exhibition of a Cheyenne woman. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other women represented in these series of Native American portraits from Baskin? There's a few. Um, we personally do not have any in the museum's collection, otherwise they would be on view. Um, and in my research, I mean, the, the portraits are endless. It, it's amazing how many he did, not only with the prints, but with watercolors and drawings and studies and all of that. Um, so there, there, there are a few, but um, they're few and far between. And that was the one the one thing about, um, you know, speaking about his work it, of that time, it it, um, it was about the humanity of things and and human suffering and expression, and it not so much about, um, you know, man versus woman or or representing different um, different parts of the world as much. Um, so I I wish we had some more on view here, but. Um, but that's a very, very good question. Um, speaking of our good friend Lothar, um, we do have a, a we have a couple of wonderful comments in the chat about him um, and um, the beautiful photo that you had of him, and certainly it made me tear up a little there. <laughs> um, seeing his, seeing his wonderfully smiling face. Um, uh, but uh, a good question is. Uh, how did how did um, Lothar and other collectors um, like him sort of come to ha create these collections? Do you want to just talk about that for a minute or two? Sure. I'm just um, going back so that I can we can focus on his sweet face for a minute. Of course, our my um, can can people see him? He my personal. Uh, my personal thing is, is off the side, there he is. Um, you know, part of it, I think, is, uh, you know, in the case of Lothar and uh, also our dear friend, Jim Sweeney, you have these men that had really um, successful careers and, um, you know, a great friendship with their partners, and yet they did not have children. And uh, so they're, um, extracurricular activities developed into other areas like going to art galleries and going to museums and um, being stricken by particular artists. And, and I remember uh, stories that, that Lothar shared about, you know, just being involved, being in Detroit, you know, in the, in, in the, in the boom of, of the car industry and going to the Detroit Institute of Art and going to see lectures and his world just was opened up by that and he traveled quite a bit and I think that was part of it too is being things up from his travels um, and and same with Jim Sweeney you know um, these art collections basically became their children and their love and so now 
we are the stewards of those children and, and try to nurture the collection and protect it and um, retell these stories so that it could live on. Um, I don't know, Teresa, if you have any other insight with that. No, I mean, I think um, certainly every collector is a little different on how they come into the passion of collecting art. Um, you know, many times it starts, um, uh, you know, I'm a collector certainly of some types of art and um, I joke a little bit about the fact that I hoard art. <laughs> Um, and it started, as I say, very innocently, as I just wanted to surround myself with beautiful things that I found beauty in. Um, and I do think, um, certainly, you know, in the case you mentioned Jim um, and Jim Sweeney and here our wonderful Lothar, I think um, you sort of hit the nail right on the head for, for, for them. Um, we are very honored to house their collections and to help um, continue the enjoyment of these pieces by everyone. Well, and I think, um, I think too, of course, there's always in some respect of uh, a passion for art that comes from, I know that Mildred was actually also a painter and she had some wonderful uh, paintings that, that I always wanted to show that, that Lothar had. And I guess they're with the family. I'm not sure now that he's passed away. Um, so in Lothar's case, you know, his wife was, was painting and, and loved art. So of course he loved it too. And in the matter of uh, Jim and Martha Sweeney, I mean, Martha um, was working for the High Museum in Atlanta in the decorative arts department. And so because of her job, um, they started going to the events and then they started frequenting the galleries and the uh, gallery walks in Atlanta. And then it kind of grew from there. So I think there's, you know, a lot of times there's, there's that initial interest because someone is, is um, either an artist or uh, working with art in some capacity and it kind of grows. Absolutely. Um, we actually have, uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, we have, a really kind of good question in the chat about um, you drew the comparison, uh, or should I say the contrast between um, Baskin's figurative work and say the abstract expressionists. Um, the question that we have in the chat is, would you say that there's any sort of similarities in that they were both sort of against uh, decoration? They both were about sort of reducing uh, the subject um, as much as they could. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and obviously there's a lot of abstraction uh, and expression in Baskin's work. And I'm trying to, you know, like this is a, a good example. And I think it's more about um, the representation of some kind of a subject matter as, to, as opposed to being completely devoid of it. Um, when you think of the other art movements in um, the 50s and 60s, like conceptual art and minimalism, um, I, I know that, that Baskin kind of bristled at all of those um, because they, I mean, in a way he was doing something new with his figurative work as the expressionists were doing, but um, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of difference, but there's there are some similarities too. And I think Ratner is a good example of that, where um, you know there there's the side of expression, the the sole purpose of expressing that can be found in abstraction and figurative work that that plays into that. Um, and I think we have a lot of representation of that here at the museum. So I would agree with that, even though. Baskin might be rolling his, in his grave at, as we're talking about it. But um, uh, wouldn't you agree, Teresa? I, I do think that there's something about sort of being a, sort of against um, excess, right? Like we mm -hmm. know that um, Baskin was pretty restrained um, in a lot of his print works um, in terms of the use of um, sort of his, his line and his color and things like that. Um, certainly when we find these really colorful pieces like the one on you behind me, 
um, they do sort of stand out from much of his work. Um, so I do think that there's some similarities in sort of the um, just moving away from perhaps what had been um, and looking for new ways of interpreting things. Um, certainly the figurative style that um, Baskin created, I think is his own. Definitely. And, and, and someday, um, you know, I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really excited to, um, uh, this conversation will likely continue as uh, we have Marjorie Green, who is our resident uh, printmaker and docent, who will also be doing a presentation about this Baskin portrait exhibit. Um, but she will be talking more about Baskin's um, printmaking techniques and lithography as well. Um, and, and perhaps uh, I, I believe she might be drawing some, some other um, comparisons with Baskin and Ratner as figure, figurative expressionists and um, other um, direct connections in, in modern art and of the time. So, I mean, this is a wormhole to say the least. Not only the, um, the side of the, the historical aspect of, um, you know, the different Native American people that are represented in the exhibition and the history of the United States, um, but also just with Baskin's massive, um, massive oeuvre of, of work that, that he's produced. I mean, we could take over the whole museum and do do something with this. Uh, with this Sounds interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, our, we have the question of when will Marjorie be lecturing on printmaking? And I know we don't we don't have a solid date on that yet. This uh, this exhibition is up through May the sixteenth. Um, so uh, as soon as we have a date set for that lecture, I know we'll let everybody know. Yeah, it will be soon. We have to, we're doing some recording next week because not only are we museum professionals, but we're, we're also um, filmmakers and uh, <laughs> we're doing all kinds of fun things in the tech world with virtual programs. And, and um, uh, so we're, we're, we're balancing that all out with all of our normal duties, but um, we're really excited to have Marjorie uh, come film with us in the galleries and then that will be posted um, probably not too long after, maybe in the next couple of weeks. Um, all right, do we have any more questions from anybody tonight before we sort of wrap up our program for the evening? I, don't, I, think I guess we're saying goodbye. Uh, I'm <laughs> okay. Hey, is, he, a lot of his faces have a lot of very dark shadows on them. Mm -hmm. Is he trying to use the dark shadows to represent death or uh, the people? There, there is some, um, uh, they do talk about that in uh, some of the text and research about why he's using those dark shadows. And certainly some can be kind of symbolic in a way. Um, uh, I think it also has a lot to do with his love for sculpture. Um, and he's, he's kind of, he's got an interesting way of distilling an image in a graphic way like you see behind me. Um, but he's also creating a lot of uh, dimension with these stark contrast and shadows. I mean, if you think about um, chiaroscuro in, in um, Renaissance painting and, and the stark uh, contrast to create depth, I mean, he's, kind of a master of that. But I think that the, the two-sided thing where it's a kind of a, a, a design element in his, in his work, but, but also um, uh, layers of, of meaning behind that as well. Okay, thanks. Wonderful. Great presentation. Well, thank you. Anybody have any other questions? No? All right. Well, this was great. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, and I hope that uh, we see you all again soon for our next program. And we will keep you posted when Marjorie will be giving, giving her program. Yay. All right. But until then, please.
take care and stay safe. Great job, Christine. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. Thanks, guys. Wonderful program. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.